do that. Uh, so let's just start with something that, that doesn't seem to be leading anywhere in particular, but we're going to see how everything ties together nicely in the end. Uh, so this is something we didn't quite have time to do when we discussed the Kleisley category. So remember that the Kleisley category was the category we constructed, where if you have a monad and you want to think of this monad as embodying some kind of effect, then the Kleisley category is the category where you have the same objects as the original category, but now all your, your old morphisms used to go from X to Y, but now your new morphisms in the Kleisley category goes from X to M of Y. So you, you get, morally you get a Y, but you also get the effect of M every time you do something. Right? Um, but then if you think of it in this way, then it should be possible to embed the original category into the Kleisley category where we just don't have any effects. So, so some kind of slogan that pure things are trivially effectful. Because remember, we always have this return of the monad which says that you can always um, inject a pure thing and, and make it trivially effectful. So, so what would say that empty function? The empty function? Yeah. Uh, right, so, so let's see. So if we can embed this, then that would be a functor from C to the classic category. Right. So let's see if we can define this. So let's do it. So we have to give the action on objects, the action on morphisms. Let's make this bigger again. Uh, and prove that it preserves identities and composition. Right. So what about the action on objects? Well, the objects in the classic category were the same as the objects in C. Right. So that means that uh, it's looks like it's easy to give a function from the objects of C, um, a function from the objects of C to the functions in the classic category. Right? Here we can be the identity, as, as you said. So let's try that. It's not the only choice we have though, right? Because we have a monad around. So we could apply the monad to X, or we could apply the monad twice to X, or 17 twice times to X. Right? So it's not, we are not completely forced here. We but the objects are the same, yeah, but I, I do have an endo functor on C yeah. right around, right? But if I want to think as the things here, I, I try to just embed things the same way, then I shouldn't really change the objects, right? Yes, we're, uh, we're selecting the canonical way of doing nothing. So here I can be the identity, but now here on morphisms, I'm given a morphism from X to Y and C, and I have to produce a morphism from the identity of X to the identity of Y in the classic category, right? But now our notion of morphism has changed in the classic category, right? It's not a morphism from X to Y in C anymore, it's a morphism from X to M of Y. So here I can't be the identity anymore, right? Uh, what can I do? Well, I was thinking of the return as the thing that really embeds trivially, right? So if I take my function f, it goes from x to y, and then I can compose with a return, that's going to make me end up in m of y. So I apply the function and then I embed that as a trivial thing. Yeah. Seems to be a good thing. Yeah. Uh, not quite, right? Because that would be a, a bunch of, uh, the return is such a thing, right? It goes from x to m of x for every x. But here I'm starting with the morphism from x to y. Yeah, I'm yeah, composing. Mm, sort of. Sort um, of, but I'm not sure if you can make that precise or not. Uh, yeah, the, the thing you could, I mean, you could start thinking about um, which things are, um, some notion of, of, of monad morphism, um, which basically means uh, you have um, uh, you have cleaner monads and you have dirtier monads, uh, and you can always get from cleaner ones so uh, to dirtier ones. That's to say, if you if you've got some way of interpreting all of the effects that can happen in one monad into another, uh, and you respect return and uh, and uh, join. join uh, then that's what gives you a monad morphism. So it, it, there's something where you can say yes, and the, the cleanest of all monads is the identity monad. Yeah, right. Uh, right. Which has no no extra effects that you need to translate to somewhere else. 
So there is a, certainly a monad morphism from the identity monad to every other monad. Yeah. And I um, guess what, what we are saying implicitly is that C here is, like, is the Kleisley category of the identity monad. Yeah. So, so we are, in that sense, we are lifting. Uh, yeah. Yes. So this. Uh, but that's not quite what we do. So now we are just doing the pedestrian thing of constructing one particular function from C into yeah, Kleisley. Yeah. yeah. But it, you know, implicitly here is indeed the um, uh, that lurking construction. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's do it. So I take my f from x to y, and then I want to afterwards compose with return. So let's compose in C, f, and then here I want to go from y to, uh, normalize that a little bit, to m of y, which is what the return of m is doing. I pass it in the y, which I can give as an underscore. Uh, okay, so that gives me an action. It takes every morphism and gives me a new morphism. And it kind of does what we think we're doing, right? We're just sticking on this trivial thing at the end, at the end of everything. So you would hope that this would work. Uh, but now we need to show that this actually preserves identities. Yeah. Uh, so what do we send the identity to? Well, it's the identity composed with return. And what's the identity in the Kleisley category? That was return. It's return. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not quite breathful, but it's almost breathful, right? It's just identity composed with something which is it's the left identity uh, property identity of left. Let's see. Yes. Okay. And then we also have to show that we preserve composition. And this now looks a little bit more complicated. Because what is this? This is the functor applied to the composition. That's the composition composed of return. And this is the composition in the classic category, which was using join and other compositions. So I think I prepare this. Yeah. Yes. But what, uh, oh, there's lots of. Doesn't quite fit in one screen. I does when you reload. Um, so it's again, it's not so hard, I think. I mean, how do you do it? I don't just want to lose time in the lecture to actually do it. That's, uh... But basically, you write down the left hand side, write down the right hand side, and you just go spotting for things where you can apply the laws of the monad. And if you can't find it immediately, you try to, to flip things around with naturality. This is draw out the, draw out the two for diagrams here. Yes. Um, so, yes, it's not as easy as just an identity left, but uh, it's okay, I think. And again, we see that we really need a loss of the monad for this to make sense. Right. Um, so th that's cheating, of course. I didn't do the hard bit. Um, but I think the only way to really do it is to do it yourself as well. It wouldn't be very helpful to see me do it. Yeah. I mean, you can see that uh, the, uh, the <laughs> ingredients are all in position. Um, that uh, there are, we've got laws that push map through everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are, um, uh, we've got, um, the crucial thing is that we've got F and G in the right order on, uh, yeah. uh, on both sides. Because that's the one thing we can't commute, right? We, we have the return and the join. So the join is implicit in the composition in classic the category. They are natural, so they commute with things, but the F and the G, they, they, they just yeah. come in this order. They, they came in here, right? So that doesn't work. Okay. Uh, so, so I think that makes, that makes sense to me at least, that you can take a pure thing and embed it as a trivially impure thing. Uh, but now, of course, we have a functor from one category to the other. So then what we should do as good category theorists is to ask, can we go the other way? Is there an adjunction? So let me ask Connor, the good category theorist, can we go the other way? Oof, we'd have to think about that. Um, 
uh, I. Uh, so this is what it would mean to go the other way, right? Yes, uh, it does seem like for every arrow in the uh, in the Kleisley category, we should be able to get something going on in yeah. the. Um, Do you want to try it? Uh, let's see. You can tell me if I'm going wrong. Uh, all right. So. Well, I mean, I'll just get Agda to tell me what I have to do. It's not rocket science. Okay. Um, so, um, I've got an object uh, in uh, the Kleisley category of C, so Kleisley category of M, uh, so it's an object in C. Now let's just see what actually I'm going to have to do with that, right? In order to figure out what to do on the objects, I should see what sort of pickle that's going to put me in uh, if uh, I, uh, um, depending on what I choose, Normalize that a lot. Okay, I'm gonna have to turn uh, morphisms from x to m of y into whatever it is I pick here, happening to x and happening to y. So that tells me that choosing the identity on objects is a really bad move because there's no way I'm going to get rid of an M. Right. Actually, the best way to explore mistakes is to make them. So let's make the mistake. Get ourselves into trouble. Then think again. Right. So I say, okay, let's do nothing to the um, uh, to the objects. And now we can see, uh, if I normalize that, that we are not going to win. Because we coming in, we're getting a morphism that, might, that gets us from X to Y, but might do some M effect. And going out, we're, being, we're having demanded of us uh, something which is pure, something uh, which just gets us from X to Y with no extra monkey business. Uh, so, um, so that was um, uh, that was too naive. However, we do have um, a um, a monad knocking around, and if I have an extra layer of wrapping, I might have more luck. So I want to do the action of funk. I think you just want to say M. What, what do I do? Just act M. Act M. Um, because the, the tactical thing is the monad re-exports act the function. Ah. And I haven't opened function in this file. Oh, that's cool. Okay. So now I've got much more of a chance uh, to get this. Um, because here this says, okay, if I've got uh, if I've got an x to m of y, then I need to get an m of x to m of y, but that's bind. Or do we have do we have a? Well, we we'll, we'll need to define it. Um, yeah, so we'll need. Um, okay, uh, so what happens? In comes f and m x. Well, um, um, not that simple. Right. Okay, so what happens? I've got, I've got my F. And F goes from X to M of Y. So... Um, 
so if I, uh, I can use the functoriality of M uh, to map F across uh, M, and that gives me two layers of, of M around Y, but I'm not afraid of having two layers of M around Y. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's do that. So that is, I do, is it map M? Uh, F map. Uh, F map M. Okay, so that's, I can do that with F. Um, so what does that give me? Uh, so that gives me something which starts in the right place, but ends up with two layers of M, but I know how to squish two layers down to one, because I can do composition in C of this thing with something else. Okay, what's this? Yes. Uh, well, um, it's very, uh, yeah, Haskell-like. Okay, so now what I see is that I need to do a, to plug in a join. Is that join M, is that a thing? Yeah, and an underscore, because it takes uh, the object explicitly. Okay, and then, um, so we've done the plumbing, hopefully uh, we'll get um, something which is going to drop out from knowing that M is a monoid, and in particular uh, uh, there is one of the monad laws which says, um, right, yeah, so we're we're checking that this uh, functor preserves uh, identity, uh, but the identity in the Cliesley category is return. Um, so we are plugging in return here, right? Yes. Then we get a map of return and then a join. And um, that was exactly one of the laws we had, that map return and then a join is the same as the identity. Yes, I can't remember what the laws are called. Is it's it called map, map return engine? join because it natural transformation. Uh, uh, that's looking pretty plausible. And now what have we here? I suspect um Another load of um, uh, well, you can see that uh, what we've got here are uh, uh, compositions involving um, uh, maps and uh, and joins. So, um, so what, uh, what are we going to do? Uh, so maybe you should look at what I prepared for the moment. I suspect that I was suspecting you might have done so, but uh, your basic rock and roll here is the fact that uh, you've got. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, that join is a natural transformation, uh, so you can bubble um, uh, bubble maps through. You can bubble f maps through joins, and you can um, squish um, multiple joins uh, together. The order of join, the order in which you squish layers by joining doesn't matter. So, uh, what's uh, is there a handy? Um, uh, no, I guess I have to do it by hand. Just... Oh, oh, you were planning to just lift it. Oh, oh. 
Yes. Right. Right. So here it's exactly the same definition of bind, right? And then we can see the laws that you will find if you, if you look up the monad laws in Haskell. They will talk about bind and return. This is the one we just use, right? Being that if you do something effectful and then immediately return it, that's the same thing as just doing the effectful thing. Um, and the other way around, and then the one that we are interested in is the last one, which talks about if you bind and bind again. So bind, bind. Okay, so what you're telling me is that just to be tidy, I should um, uh, replace this with bind f. Right, you could, I suppose. And then this was oh, oh, bind. You can't. Oh, bind m on f. Oh, I lost the. Oh, I, somehow I'm in <laughs> trouble. You're in insert mode. I've somehow managed to find my way into overwrite mode. Okay. All right, and then which one was the bind bind? Well, that was uh, so you did uh, bind okay. return. Yeah. Well, uh, it's. Uh, I'm just trying to keep it tidy. So yeah. yeah. So in particular, we see that the, the bind we see from Haskell is actually coming from somewhere. It's what you need in order to define this function. And it's, it's equivalent with having the, the join presentation. Is that going to? OK. And this thing, uh, this proof, I think is, the important thing is this join joining here in the middle. Right? Yes, is that you use uh, naturality to push the maps out of the way and bring the two joins next to each other. And then... <laughs> yeah. So it's another instance where it's actually harder to, to understand it than to just do it in a way. But yes, you, you generally, when you're doing this kind of proof, uh, you make a decision as to which direction you're going to use naturality in. You shove everything uh, one way or the other. Um, OK, yeah. and then I think you managed to define a functor, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, so, goodness me, uh, we've got... Uh... <sighs> so we have two functors, so we could now see are they adjoint to each other or not, right? Yeah. Um, right, uh, no. So, <laughs> um... And of course, uh, well, okay, so they are... Yeah, there's only one way you can do this, right? No, you could try it the other way too, right? But yes, but normally we expect the thing that's forgetful to live on the right. I mean, I'm not sure if sometimes forget, you get. I'm not sure if forget is the right answer here, but I mean, there's more structure in the closely category compared to the other category, right? Yes. But it's not just throwing away structure. We're actually applying M, right? So in that sense, forget is not a very good name. But... Well. If you think about what it does to the morphisms, um, right, it's using uh, bind, which is again we're, so shuffling things around a little bit. Right. right. So we are uh, we are generate we are generating very particular transformations of effectful computations um, from. Uh, uh, I mean. It, or, all right, you know, if you want to think of it differently, not in terms of effects, but if you think of them as term monads, then what we're saying is 
that we are forgetting that some sort of term eating function was in fact a substitution. Yes. Uh, right, I guess we'll see that when, I mean, okay, so step one is to see if you actually have an adjunction here, right? Um, then we can see what we can do with it. So, so how did we get here? Well, we said that there should be some way to embed pure things. Then we said maybe there's some way to go the other way, and now we're exploring if there's actually an adjunction between these things that relate them together. So let's see what Agda tells us what we have to do. So we have to take a map which goes from embed Kleisley of M into something and turn and flip it around so that there's a forget Kleisley on the right instead, right? So here's my... Um, here's my F, which has an embed Kleisley on the left. That was just the identity on objects, so that's a little bit hard to see. Um, and then I need to turn it into a forget Kleisley on the right, but that's M applied to the right, right? So actually, I can just use the F directly here. Everything is set up very nicely. And I mean... That like you should have a forgetful. Right, yes, it wouldn't have worked again, even if we somehow magically would yeah. be able to do the action of morphisms. Uh -huh then it would have failed at this stage. Right? We're, we're, we're getting optimistic here because one direction of our isomorphism is the identity. That's it. <laughs> Let's uh, see what's happening on the other side. Um, well, we are again quite lucky. Right? <laughs> Why is this? Well, so now we started with something which goes into a forget. So that's something that goes into an M of something. And um, then we have to flip that round to an identity on this side. Right? But now in the Kleisley category, which puts another M on it, which is why it, it works so nicely. Right. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, okay, so here, of course, these are now going to be very easy to prove. But we are, so naturality used to be very easy. It just used to be REPL all the time. Right? But this time it's a little bit more complicated. Because what we're talking about here is an equation in the Kleisler category. Right? So it's saying that if you first compose and then transform, that should be the same thing as if you first transform and then compose. But this is happening in the classic category. So to compose here really means to, to monkey around with the joints and the binds, etc. Right. So even though this looked very simple, now here we still have some work to do in order to show that this is actually natural. And I'm going to use the, the, the Duke's A machina again to, to just get out of this. <laughs> A Blue Peter technique. Here's one I prepared earlier. Yes. Again, I mean, if you get to this point and it's not natural, then, then that would be very, very surprising, right? Everything lines up so nicely, but you still have to fight a little bit to see that this actually works. Okay, just uh, from that to that. Yes. And again, I mean, it's a little bit noisy, but we are using, we are using, we're using a lot of naturality of the components. And somewhere we are going to make them fuse. Right. Naturality, 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 return join here. So we had to return somewhere and we made it hit a join to, to kill it, to make it an identity. Right. And the rest of it is just naturality. Um, so that's nice in a way. So we, we started with a monad, 
we constructed the Claisley category, and we had these two functors that went to and from it, and they formed an adjunction. And then last time, we saw that whenever we had an adjunction, that gave rise to a monad. So now there could be two interesting things happening. Either we, we get the same monad back, and that would be nice because then every monad arises from an adjunction, right? It's a canonical way to factor the monad as an adjunction. So it originally went from C to C, but now we factored it to go from C to Kleisley and then back to C by composing these things, right? So that would be interesting. It would also be interesting if this did not happen, right? Because then we would get a sequence of monads. You start from one, you, you do this factoring, you get another monad, you do it again, you get another one, etc. But in this case, it's going to turn out that, that we get the original monad back. So, so we can show that every adjunction gives us an algorithm. Yeah, so now we're saying that in fact you can get all monads this way. It is not just the case that whenever you're lucky enough to have an adjunction, then you get a monad. Every monad arises from an adjunction. Uh, well, every adjunction gives rise to a monad, right? So, so in that sense, yes. But whenever you have an adjunction, you compose them, you get a monad. That uh, Right, no. So, so in particular, every monad arises from many different yeah, adjunctions. So this is one way to factor it, but there's other ways. But this, this is the, the smallest way to factor it. But, uh, okay, uh, so before we prove this, let me ask some, just the other little thing here. But what does it mean to show that two monads are equal? Well, a priori you have to show that everything is equal, right? Including the proofs of the laws. But in fact, it's enough. So these two fields, these two things here, are what it means to show that the functors are equal, so they agree on the objects. And then you have to fix up the type with this proof a little bit. But after you've done that with the subs, you're saying that they agree on the f-maps. Uh, and then you're saying that the returns are equal. Again, you have to fix up the type because the return talks about the action on objects, right? So we're saying that return of m is equal to return of n, and join of m is equal to join of m. You could think, well, do you really need task for these? And yes, you do, because there can be many different monad structures on the same functor. It's another fun thing to think about. But, uh, but we are not saying anything about how all the equations are the same. Right? That, that's what uh, this little ah. dance does. Um, I mean, basically boils down to this. Uh, so let's now see if we can actually prove this. Um, Okay, so this says that if you give me any monad, then I'm going to prove that this monad m is equal to the monad I get from the Claisley adjunction. So I'm proving that two monads are equal, so I'm going to use the NAS constructed, and it takes one proof that they agree on objects, one proof that they agree on morphisms, one proof that the returns are the same, and one proof that the um, you know, joints are the same. But uh, right, so this is the, the, mon the representation with uh, return and join, yeah, because that's that's the one that makes it nice to define the closely adjunction. Yeah. Uh, okay, and I also gave this M and M, I think, right? Yes. Okay. So, start suit well enough. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> we because want. We really want this to be REPL because yes. of all of those subs. <laughs> because everything else was substing on this. Okay, so why is this so easy? Well, so here on the left, I just have M, right? The action of objects of M. Here on the right, that was on the left. Here on the right, I have the composite of the two adjunctions, right? The action of objects. The first one was the identity. The second one was applying M. So all in all, this is going to be an identity composed of M, which is the same as just M. Right. Okay. Um, the subs computer way. Yeah, so now we need that the action on 
morphisms, the F map should be the same. And what do we see? Well, we see again one of these F F map of M of a return followed by a join, right? That's a map return join. So but we see a lambda there on the left, so we probably want to use extensionality. Okay, and what else is happening? So I also have this little H in the middle, right? So this bit here should be the identity, and then I should just have the f map of h left. But it's a little bit too much work to do ourselves. Uh, do we have time for this? Not really. So here is the same thing. Right, um, we see there's a map return join in the middle, and then um, the rest of it is just by shuffling around the so brackets. Is the yeah, it's that's brackets. Yeah, uh, so that's the thing we can put in here. Okay, what else do we need to show? We need that the returns are the same. Phew. That's now <laughs> yeah. quite easy. Oh, okay, I proved it down here as well. Might as well use it then, I guess. Uh, is it worth it? It's not really. Is that not just REPL? Yeah, it's just REPL. So, but. <laughs> yes. Yes. This is a classic. Um... <laughs> Gives the lemma a name that is longer than its proof. <laughs> so. Uh, so the point that is not completely stupid to do this is that when you read this file after it says all done down here, right? Yes. Then you can actually see what's going on because you're given the type. So that's why I left it in. But, uh, but then we should use it except, right, so it's a little bit annoying, right? This thing doesn't talk about the X, right? So I'll actually have to use it like this, right? Is that same just talking to be out? Oh, it's, this is it's the, the other way around. Inverse of extensionality, right? Um, yes, I should have changed this to, I mean, okay, let's do it properly. You can do this one point wise. And then this whole dance goes away. Right. You'll still need a paren, yeah. Okay, that's better. Um, and then finally, what do we need? So again, we don't need much, right? So we need that the joins are the same. Uh, this is just the join on the left. This is the join you get if you go through the process of reconstructing it from the adjunction. And the way that the composition works was with a join in it, but now you, you map it. with the identity first. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's the kind of thing where I think having this little solver is really helpful because what, what you need to do step by step, well, first you need that the map preserves the identity and then that composing with the identity is nothing. But that's exactly and what the solver... Not just with yeah, so the, sol the solver here takes care of all of this. 
Yes, that's just... <laughs> uh, from... Uh, elementary category and functor shuffling. Um, so I think that's rather neat. So every monad really comes from an adjunction, right? These are not two different concepts. They are literally the same concept to some work. So. Do you have any further comments? Well, I mean, that, that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. up, that's up to you, of course, but um, they are very closely related, right? Because as soon as you have a monad, you have an adjunction. As soon as you have an adjunction, you have a monad. Yeah. Um, but it's also um, the, um, the other way around in the sense, well, the adjunctions also give you uh comonads yes uh so that's uh that's to say um because you can flip things flip these functors from the left to the right you can either pile them all up on the right that gives you a monad or pile them all up on the left that gives you a comonad seen all these proofs to your line yes. show that very well Right, and, and what is a comonad? A monad gives you effects because it gives you an X and some extra M stuff, right? A comonad has the M on the left, so it gives you an X as an input plus some extra context that, that you can use when you, when yes. you define your, your function. Um, so you can think of, uh, yeah, I like to think of monads as talking about ways of doing more and comonads as ways of seeing more. The dual to the return says, if you've got some x in context, you can ignore the context and just get your hands on the x. So it's, M of x to x, right? Yeah. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the dual to multiplication says, uh, if you've got um, if you've got a thing in context, um, so uh, you should, the way to think about it is to, to imagine that you've got a structure full of X's, but one of them is in focus. So the, the dual to return projects out the thing that's in focus. And uh, the thing which does the... Uh, the dual of multiplication decorates all the things with uh, with their own context. So each thing is put in the focused position. Um, so uh, it's actually fun to do this with um, uh, non-empty lists and things like that. Um, so a non-empty list has a head. Um, but uh, every, every element of a non-empty list can be seen as the head of um, uh, the head of a non-empty sublist of the original list. What do I mean? Uh, that um, So the, if you start with one, two, three, that's a non-empty list, then the, the, the co-return uh, gives you one, that's the head. The co-join gives you a list of lists, one, two, three, two, three, three. Where if you now do the co-return, if you map the co-return after co-join, you get back your list one, two, three. Um, and you can see, 
So the thing in each position has been decorated with its context. In this case, the context is the tail of, of the non-empty list. So this is a nice example of, uh, uh, of a commonad. Well, okay, we didn't have time to, to do commonads properly, but I hope you, you've seen that you can, you can gain something by trying to structure your programs mathematically, trying to use these things to, to write cleaner programs. Um, so for that, for that you'll say one in of itself is that in this list, but the actual complex for one is the whole list. Yes. Uh, so we're thinking of the head position as being the position in focus. Yeah. So the co-join tells you how to refocus, tells you all the ways you can refocus. Yes, in some sense. Yeah, but, but for lists, people, the order yes. matters. Yeah, it's all the Yes. Uh, and more generally, um, you can think of these things as kind of navigation operations uh, that are, allow you to move a cursor around in a data structure. Is it saying all the possible ways to move the cursor? Uh, yes, yeah, so the idea is, so if you've got a data structure with a cursor in it that's, that's sitting at one component, then that, that's going to give you a comonad structure because you can always project out what's currently at the cursor. Yeah, basically, yeah, point at an element. Um, and uh, um, this, uh, um, yeah, so the, the, the co-join tells you all the ways you can move the cursor, including not moving it at all. Locally or globally? Uh, globally. Uh, Is there a way to get local yeah, if there is some sensible, um, if you if you've got some sensible way to say global things are built compositionally from from local layers, then you can very then you can very easily say uh, let's just talk about what it's like to move around within one layer. Uh, right, I know it. Uh, we should stop. So I hope you enjoy. Send them more to be done if you're interested. So let's, let, let's stop here. Yes. Uh, we seem to have... One of the things that's joyful about teaching dependency type programming in 2022 is that there's now so much of it we have to make really fairly vicious editorial choices about what to leave out. What to leave out. <laughs>